I think because the world moves so quickly, we're very quick to jump in and try and solve a problem. Um, and so I think uh, one of the pieces that stands out the most uh, for me is, you know, the ability to listen. And I think we're seeing um, some definite challenges coming after the pandemic where folks were so reliant on digital communication um, that it's hard for them to start a conversation um, and go back and forth. Um, you know, even in being uh, the political climate that we're in right now, instead of um, having, you know, civil discourse and understanding that we don't have to be right, um, to be heard. Um, I think leaders really need to come into that space and be willing to listen, to observe, um, to understand that there may not always be a right reason or what was right yesterday may not be right tomorrow. All right, guys, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Heart and Hustle podcast. Now, today is going to be an amazing conversation because I'm sitting across from somebody who is the definition of heart and hustle, specifically in the higher education space. Now, I have an amazing leader across this table with me. I have Sarah Williamson, who's the Dean of Students at Newman University. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Keenan. It's great to be here. I'm incredibly excited to kind of learn about your unique perspective on what's happening right now in the space of higher education, especially when it comes to student expectations, the things that they're looking for when it comes to their education, the investment, if you will, but also some of the ways in which you're helping this next generation think bigger and think different about their experience as well. So before we kind of dive into today's episode, how does one become a dean of students, especially you know at such a young, accomplished age? What was kind of your journey like between where we started and how we got here? Oh, awesome. I mean, great question. I uh, grew up, my dad is a teacher. Um, actually, it runs in his entire side of the family. Um, and the one thing they told me before I went to undergrad is what they wanted me to do was be anything but a teacher. Um, and so it's this running family joke um, that I, I went into the family business um, in regards to it. I actually started off, though, um, wanting to go into dietetics uh, nutrition. Uh, my dad had an emergency heart surgery when I was uh, in high school. Um, and so I saw the power of these terrific uh, health professionals um, and thought this was the pathway for me. And then like many folks who decided to go into the health and sciences, um, I found anatomy and physiology was not my cup of tea whatsoever um, in regards to it. Uh, and so I was just really fortunate along the way that I had these great professionals. I, I worked as a tour guide and I missions, I worked in residence life, that kind of gave me that pat on the back and that support. And I learned about this field of student affairs that I didn't even know was a possibility for a career. Um, and so it, it really ended up opening my doors to possibilities um, as I went through it. And, and that's really the story of my whole career. I just have come across some really magnificent individuals that have helped me see the potential in myself. Um, and so now as I step into this Dean of Student space, you know, I get the joy and pleasure of helping students along their way and, and finding their joy and potential and opening doors and helping them see possibilities that maybe they didn't consider before they walked into that space. Student affairs is so fundamental for setting the tone, right, of somebody's experience in higher education. What was kind of like the aha moment where you got that pat on the back, if you will, where you knew that student affairs and this entire space was something that you were going to give your most important resource your time to? Yeah, uh, that's a terrific question. Um, I think there's been a series uh, of moments uh, along the way. Um, but in particular, I actually... Um, I went to undergrad at the University of Delaware, um, and I was there uh, and had the ability to work in residence life with a terrific group of individuals that actually piloted the first uh, co-curricular experience um, and, and a curriculum for residential um, students of what they wanted them to actually learn. Um, so talking about that return on investment, you know, if you're living on campus for four years, by the end of the four years, what do we hope you learn in this high density environment? Um, and so being in Invited into spaces um, and, and having a chance to contribute to what that curriculum actually looked like along the way. And for folks saying, you know, student affairs is more than just throwing pizza parties. It's about building community. It's about capturing that learning um, and those moments that may not always be realized, you know, helping somebody process after class or connecting, you know, that experience from an internship into the next one, um, 
into a future career um, or what they learned in a class and having those aha moments. And uh, for me, that was really it. So I got invited a seat at the table um, in undergrad with some of the most incredible uh, professionals I've ever met who then opened the door and, and showed me some different sides. So I've had the joy of working in residence life. I worked in health promotion during the pandemic, um, student conduct, um, which is sometimes a challenging space to being with students when they're not always at their best um, and trying to, you know, help them, you know, learn from moments that could be really a period of challenge to get them connected into the right supports. Um, but it all started because somebody was kind enough to invite me to the table and, and show me, you know, the profound impact that we can have um, in those spaces. I'm really interested to get your perspective when you're coming through higher education yourself as a student, right? What were some of the opportunities that you tried to, I would say, change impact when you became somebody who was in charge of student affairs and dean of student? Were there any type of perspectives where you said, I'm going to do things differently? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I look back to some of the decisions that I had folks kind of redirect me in a different way um, that I might have been making in undergrad, you know, sometimes not studying the way I should. I, I mean, I think we see oftentimes students coming into their first year not having strong study skills, um, right? And so how do you actually study for the first time for many uh, people or how do you conduct research or really write uh, robustly. Um, and so I try and take that lens into the work that I did. And so I remember I had this wonderful GA position uh, where I was doing health, uh, well-being, alcohol, and drug education. And I tried to mix up, you know, let's bring some fun to this, but let's actually teach folks what they really need to know. What are the things um, that they should do? I now, even to this day, I love getting into that space and doing like alcohol and other drug education. And so um, along my way, in my research, I found uh, fun facts are a really great way to kind of capitalize on the attention. And so there's this really interesting study that was done um, back at Purdue in, in the early 2000s uh, when Red Bull and vodka was really popular. And so one of the things that I actually found is that physiologically drinking a Red Bull and vodka can have the same effects as doing a line of cocaine. Um, and so for students, it just resonates with them so much and they remember it. But I've had that like moment that, that you can capitalize it, that almost shock and awe um, that opens a space for you to have some really important dialogues with it. Like, all right, why are we choosing to consume this? You know, how does it impact my body? How can we bring a greater sense of awareness in this? How can I make more informed choices moving forward? Um, and the number of times I've had students come to my office like afterwards and be like, oh, I was at a bar and the student and I was like, did you know? And it sticks with them. And so, I, you know, some of those changes, instead of just sitting in the front of a room and giving yet another PowerPoint presentation um, and sounding like the, you know, teacher from Charlie Brown, like womp, 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 womp at the front. How do we get folks engaged in dialoguing and, and remembering these cool, fun things that they're going to carry with them? Because those are the memories and those are the moments of change that are really going to, you know, make a large impact on the line. I mean, it's just, it's so impressive to hear about how you're changing the way in which we engage with this different generation because they have been conditioned to think about things like fun facts, right? And those are the <laughs> things that are impactful rather than standing up there like that teacher, like Charlie Brown. So cool. Really yeah, interesting. Absolutely. Now, I, one, thing I, one thing I know about you is you're also an adjunct faculty member at West, Westchester University. So you're doing a lot in the higher education space. What is this? What are you doing there as an adjunct faculty member? Yeah, I um, had the privilege of I've adjunct on and off, um, interestingly enough, in the leadership space and talking a lot about that um, over uh, my career. But I had the ability and was invited back to help train the next generation of student affairs professionals. Um, and so what's been really beautiful is I'm working with a cohort of students now that are in their last year of the program. Um, and we're talking about what does leadership look like in an implied environment? What does it actually look like in practice? Um, and so this is a great space. Again, you were talking about, you know, what are some of the ways to pivot and change? And um, I, I work with a wonderful group of faculty members and we adjusted the course uh, to incorporate in a section of it, looking at politics, policy, governance and higher education. So what are the things that leaders really need to know to be able to cultivate change whenever they step into these environments? Right. How do you understand the political landscape that you're walking into? Um, what is that increase? 
incremental change look like? What is the best way um, to manage from the middle? Um, and so we're having these really intentional conversations that are not only looking at the current events that are happening in higher education and, and the need and the skills and the qualities of leaders, but what does it actually look like applied in, in practice, right? Um, transformational leadership and James McGregor Burns is great, but what does that actually look like um, when you're in a day-to-day -day space? And so um, it's been such a breath of fresh air to get to spend time with these folks that just want to change and improve or, or have a lasting impact like those who had it on them um, in their own experiences for undergrad. And so, yeah, teaching has been really fun and, and doing some, you know, different and, and applied concepts and helping them really think about who do they want to be as that professional in the field. What was the family's uh, reception when you said, hey, I'm going to go teach this next generation of great leaders based on the advice that they gave you? Well, you know, I have some uh, not so tiny humans um, who have only ever been on college campuses. And so um, my, my nine year old thought I was going to Hogwarts to teach them. And so I think in some ways, you know, student affairs professionals absolutely have some magic like Hogwarts. Um, but I did have to let her know that there wasn't that kind of a letter coming in the mail. Um, but I think it's awesome. I look at my kids, right? Um you know, I, I didn't know this field existed. I, um, you know, grew up, um, my, my dad taught, um, but my experience more aligns with uh, some of the things that a first generation college student um, goes through and experiences just for the simple fact that my dad ended up putting himself through school um, going into the army. He actually served in Vietnam. Um, and so his experience is very not traditional. He commuted, you know, and he was in ROTC and then ended up serving. Um, and so that living on campus, you know, more traditional college age experience was not uh, common in my family. It, it, nobody else had that. That. Um, and so it's funny watching my kids now grow up in this space where they know what it's like to see these like incredible leaders and, and speeches on campus. Um, you know, my doc, my daughter has been featured on social medias with university presidents and hanging out and um, she thinks it's the coolest thing and, and says that she wants to be a girl boss going up and, you know, that she wants to teach and learn and be a leader. But I think all those doors open up because of the fact that she's had the opportunity to step foot on that campus. And um, it's great to see them on it. So I did have to break some hearts that I don't work at Hogwarts, uh, but it, it's really cool to see them get excited that like this is a career and that this is a way that we serve in other ways um, and help the next generation. You know, that that first generation college student is really important for today's conversation, because one of the things that you shared in a previous talk was that 65 percent, I believe, of the population that goes to Newman is that definition of a first generation college student. Right. Many of them are Pell eligible, low income families. So how does that kind of contribute to the lived experience that you've kind of been able to kind of, I would say, observe from your dad's college experience and how you think about this new generation of students who kind of come into the space? Yeah, I, Newman's a really special place, right? We talk about social mobility and and having a population that 67%, 65% get on a given year for generation college students. Um, the other part that's really neat about us is that there was actually an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer that came out at the start of the semester that talked about how um, specifically institutions in the Philly area are so are serving um, less uh, minority uh, students, less uh, Latino, um, less black uh, students coming into it. And yet here at Newman, that's not our experience. Um, our, our institution is actually growing in the populations. We are more diverse each year and coming forward, but it's interesting to to see this this place in higher education, and so I love the the space that you're talking about um, about serving this population. And I look back to my dad's experience, and and he was a first generation by a true definition uh, college student, right? Who paid his way through uh, using GI benefits um, and going and, and serving then in the uh, Air Force for a very long time uh, thereafter. And so you know there was even a piece of tension when I went to school about not understanding like what is a dean of students like I. I'm I'm pretty sure even I, as a professional, didn't know what a dean of students was until I started working for a dean of students, right? And so we have to remember when we're working with first generation families that this is new. This is an experience. It's something different for their families. And that as much as we're orienting our students into spaces, we need to orient our families, right? We need to look at the holistic approach of our student. I mean, that's the heart of why Student Affairs was actually started, was to look at not only what you learn in a classroom, but the look of the development of the whole person. 
I mean, I think that ties back to like the 1930s when the like field really first just came about. Um, and I think sometimes we forget um, that this is a new experience and that folks don't know what FAFSA stands for or FERPA or any of the other higher education alphabet soup. Um, so I appreciate that at Newman, we take to heart this ability to really transform the next generation, to open doors uh, for folks that are first generation college students, for folks that you know may not have considered uh, going to universities uh, or colleges because of the cost of it um, and the impact to their family and really help provide an experience that sets them up for success down the line. But we do that in a way that we walk with our students and their families uh, along the way. I talk about it at orientation when I'm welcoming new students, I'm welcoming families too, because they're all part of our community. Um, and, and that's a really beautiful thing that comes with working uh, on a predominantly first generation college campus. I think it's a huge advantage that you guys have the ability to instill what the higher education process looks like for someone who doesn't have any family reference to it, right? The predetermined expectation of what higher education is going to be, the access, the experience that comes from mom and dad often I think can be a little bit of a disadvantage. But when you come into a university like Newman, we have a fresh slate, we can reestablish what everything looks like, but also you have so many other challenges that are involved with the current college demographic, right? Higher education equals often the perception of opportunities for debt, which turns into family debt, means more family involvement. We also have students who are working two, three jobs sometimes to be able to pay for school. So what do you kind of think about the current landscape of higher education and I guess the the elbow grease that's necessary to kind of make it through this process for a lot of students today? Yeah, I mean, there is. There's rising costs. You can look, um, you know, for the public school sector, you're seeing less and less uh, state funding into it. And so that has to be offset somewhere. And that's typically tuition um, if you're not getting the donations from, uh, you know, different sources to help fund that. Um, and so you're right. That is absolutely something that has, you know, come out. There's some great nonprofit groups that are advocating for um, debt cancellation and, and whatnot in regards to it because of the cost of higher education. It's just jumped up so exponentially. Um, but in addition to that, you have this challenge of like, what is the ROI? Um, we have, there's upcoming ruling talking about um, a law that goes into place. I'm thinking of it, it's going to come to me. I promise it will come back to me um, in regards to it. But institutions are going to have to start um, posting salaries and graduation rates um, of different majors, right? As part of, oh my gosh, I'm, all right, give me 30 seconds, Keenan, to Google this. This is going to like escape me. So yeah, go ahead. The actual uh, name of this law. Uh, gainful employment is the law that... Um, this is so interesting to me because how are we supposed to make informed decisions about the path that we go through in higher education if we don't understand the grassroots, hard facts, understanding of what is the graduation rate and then what is the anticipated salary that I'm going to be able to recoup this investment in? This seems so fundamental, but so obvious at the same time. Right. And it all comes back to this idea of, of pay transparency. So, um, you know, if I'm understanding, you know, what kind of came about of this when uh, President Biden went to cancel um, some of the student loans during the pandemic, one of the things that happened um, was almost a negotiation of, you know, what is the value of higher education in regards to it? Um, and if we're going to end up canceling debt, then is the degree in which they're getting um, actually contributing to um their future careers, right? Are, are they taking on more debt than they can really um, pay off in the long run? And so there is a ruling. It was originally supposed to go uh, in October to be posted where institutions were going to have to start publishing publicly, not only the graduation rates in different majors, but they were going to have to actually start posting um, what the average salary was. And it's the gainful employment law. So the gainful employment law was coming forward and saying that you have to post this information publicly. Um, and so that it's that transparency. But it also um, the second part of the gainful employment is that there is an impact that the government may say that, hey, you are not gainfully employing folks in a particular major at an appropriate salary rate that should be determined by the government at a later date. And if that's the case, then you can't use federal funds to have somebody in that major. So imagine math, for instance, you gain, cannot gainfully employ somebody at what the federal government says is the appropriate salary at the appropriate graduation rate in it. And so then you can no longer use federal funds to pay for folks to take math as a major 
or as a course, right? It, it is this, this gainful employment ruling that originally was supposed to come out in October, and I think it's now been pushed back to July. Um, and, and so there's still nuances and higher education institutions are still trying to figure out what exactly um, is gonna be the requirement, but it, it's gonna be a game changer. There's a benefit to it, right? Because students can now make more informed choices when they're coming in, but most students don't know what they want to do when they come in. In fact, I think it's the average student changes their majors up to three times um, over the course of their career. So if you're looking when you're coming in your first year and you're like, I'm going to be a doctor, right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer. Um, but that's not actually what you end up being. You end up falling in love with theology, right? That That's going to change the course of where you go from there, right? And, and it's a hard thing. So it's a benefit because you see this transparency. But on the downside, right, for those of us in a liberal arts education who are really um, helping to cultivate critical thinking in addition to giving folks those critical skills um, that they can use in careers, some of which don't even exist right now, um, you know, things like this could have a really... Um, interesting impact in higher education and what the future of it looks like, um, especially when you're looking at more and more graduates or going into career fields that don't even exist when they start um, in a higher education institution. And, and so gainful employment is just an interesting one down the line that we're going to see um, that goes back to this idea of how much uh, debt that folks take on and, and what is a reasonable amount of student loans, um, really looking at, you know, lessening the intergenerational impact of it. So I think it's going to be a really interesting place um, to watch in higher education. But, you know, gainful employment came out this summer. Then you have uh, Title IX regulations, which are all over the place with injunctions and how institutions are moving forward. And so you have a lot of different um, federal government legal um, aspects of higher education that that on top of a declining uh, birth rate and, and enrollment rate of college ready students coming in, it, it's going to be an interesting climate moving forward with it. Um, and I think the folks that can be innovative and creative in those higher education spaces are really going to be the ones um, that survive the upcoming years and also create a next generation of leaders that will create the same type of impact in their future careers and their future pathways in their communities. Um, so I, th I think it's definitely a period for us to be innovative and in where we're headed. To. Man, isn't it wild to think about how quickly things are moving, right? I mean, like I think about artificial intelligence as a simple example, dropped in 2022, available to the public. Now it seems like everybody's thinking about how they can get into this space, but is there? a higher curriculum pathway or a higher education curriculum pathway that we can push people towards to be ready for the changing landscape of the marketplace. It's almost like we're being challenged to move faster, to be able to catch up with how quickly the market moves and changes and adapts. But I think that also mirrors society, right? We're moving so quickly that sometimes we don't stop and take a pause. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we jump from one thing to the next things. We're constantly moving the goals as we go. Um, and we never take a pause to actually stop and reflect and look around the room. We're just constantly moving. Right. It, it happens with folks chronically being on the phone. Um, I was with a group of students not too long ago. Um, right. And we're just waiting for, for a speaker to come in and everybody pulls out their phone and jumps on their phone in that moment. And it it's that like not using those soft skills of that networking in that space, or even just having a moment to breathe or connect with each other in regards to it. I mean, we're seeing the same thing in higher education. It's moving so rapidly um, because there's so many different pressures on the environment and, and there's nothing new for higher education. It's the same thing in all other different fields across the board. Um, but we have this culture of busyness and rapidly changing environments that you know, sometimes we just need to take a moment and pause and be like, all right, what is what is at the heart? Where are we actually going with this? Um, I have a wonderful faculty member at one point in time that said radical. To be radical means to get to the root. And so at some point in time, we actually need to get to the root and the heart of what is higher education, right? What is the purpose? Do we believe it is preparing folks in their future careers and that it's about, you know, collecting as many skills and attributes as you get? Or do we think it's about critically thinking, right? And helping folks, you know, reevaluate and look at things through a different lens, a critical lens moving forward, right? Um, do we think it's some sort of hybrid in between? But at some point in time, we need to get to the root of what we're doing um, in order to move forward. I was listening to an amazing podcast a couple of weeks ago. I might have brought this up in our previous conversation. So excuse me if I'm repeating myself. I guess if we're recording this, then this is the first time I'm saying this. Um, so <laughs> former employee, like a number 20 something at Facebook, right? 
on a podcast with Joe Rogan, and we're talking about what the future of education looks like. And this guy says, you know, very transparently, in the future, artificial intelligence is going to take a ton off of our plate, even meaning how we do tasks, how we get things done, X, Y, Z. So the future of higher education and teaching in general is going to be so valuable because we're going to teach kids how to think about the problems that they're trying to tackle rather than how they'll get them done, think creatively about the problem. And so I think that we're at a really interesting clipping point in society where like this technology is progressing so quickly. We don't even know what's going to be the current status in the next five years of how integrated artificial intelligence is going to be into our life. So the role of higher education helps us cre think critically about these problems that we're facing, that seems like uh, a sure man's bet for the valuable skill sets that we're going to need to develop in the future in order to be the leaders of the future, like you're talking about. Yeah, I, I absolutely think you're correct. You know, having finished my dissertation, right, about two years ago at this point in time, right, AI was just, chat GBT was just coming onto it, right? And so I'm so grateful in some ways that AI wasn't there because I, I like the writing is mine, 110% in that. But since then, and that's such a short period of time, now I'm seeing tools coming into higher education where there's AI chatbots where, you know, you can drop all the syllabus um, for your institution across the board or link it up into a platform like Canvas or Blackboard or D2L. And so a student can literally text a question to an AI chatbot and say, hey, when is my Spanish homework due? And get a response right there. And, and, and so I think you're right. I think, right, with moving very quickly, I think technology scares folks at some point in time. Um, it's been interesting to watch in higher education that folks have like started being like AI, you can't use it and writing policies um, for it. And then they walked it back to be like, wait, what if this is the starting point? And then we actually allow folks to then critically think on top of it. Uh, but it is moving really quickly. And, and I think we need to have some honest conversations about how this tool can really shape moving forward so that we use our human abilities to be those critical thinking, to think about new um, going on it, right? Because AI is gonna pull from what is already known, but only we can take advantage of these little moments and think about what will be new. Um, we talk a lot about how, you know, higher education is a space of knowledge creation. And I, I think even in the AI space, um, it's ripe for opportunities for us to kind of explore it even more in the future. And we have to be willing to be uncomfortable in the unknown um, as we're looking ahead for it. I definitely think there's a space for AI in there. Flex that muscle of curiosity, right? Because it's so human to react to a moment in in time where it's like the internet's coming out. That's the end of the world. It's like the farm's coming or the tractor's coming out. That's the end of farming, right? We've made this mistake time and time again. And I hope that we are able to approach this new technology with a lens of curiosity that helps us lean into the mindset exactly like what you're talking about. I mean, let's not uh, make Y2K a thing again, right? When we're looking at <laughs> Do AI. you remember? <laughs> <laughs> right when we thought, you know, the computers in the world was going to break at, you know, 1201, um, just because nobody thought to put 2000 as a possible year in a computer system, right? Uh, we're navigating AI, like, I, I, you know, just because it's new does not mean it's Y2K. Here's a, here's a question. So I know that you're incredibly passionate about transformative leadership and what these next generation of leaders are going to have to be incredibly skilled at to navigate this uncertain future. What's kind of the emphasis of how leadership has changed from your perspective and what we need to start letting our next generation know about before they end up falling into this leadership trap that it seems like we're headed towards. Mm. I think because the world moves so quickly, we're very quick to jump in and try and solve a problem. Um, and so I think uh, one of the pieces that stands out the most uh, for me is, you know, the ability to listen. And I think we're seeing um, some definite challenges coming after the pandemic where folks were so reliant on digital communication um, that it's hard for them to start a conversation um, and go back and forth. Um, you know, even in being uh, the political climate that we're in right now, instead of um, having, you know, civil discourse and understanding that we don't have to be right um to be heard. Um, I think leaders really need to come into that space and be willing to listen, to observe, um, to understand that there may not always be a right reason or what was right yesterday may not be right tomorrow um, and understanding those different changing demographics with it. And so I think we're seeing more and more leaders that need to be agile and adaptable with it. But I think we need to make sure that we also rely on each other. Um, I think that's really what helps moves us forward is, is that 
that ability to talk out things and collaborate and lean on each other's strengths along the way. Uh, but we need to give ourselves space and we need to be willing to have conversation um, and let go of who's going to be right in the moment and really just move forward to what is going to be the best thing for our space and whatever that domain is going to be. My last guest on the podcast brought up an amazing concept. He said, there's a difference between difference and division. Mm. We are okay with having difference because that is healthy. Different perspectives, different ideas gives us the opportunity to understand. Division is casting somebody else's idea aside as if it has no value and it's us versus them, aka othering people. That was a really unique perspective to me because we are so good at othering people rather than creating and understanding the differences that we have about a topic or our own perspective, which is really interesting to me. What do you think about that different or the the concept of differences versus division? Yeah, no, I, I think you're spot on. Um, and it's a beautiful point um, that your last guest uh, made. You know, I, I think it's so easy to look at what is different in that space, but look at it from a lens of that, you know, there's this huge gap between your different experience and mine and forgetting any similarities that may come forward with it. Um, you know, I think there's also that place of like exploration and, and um, when you don't know, like not being okay with being in that space that you may not always know or that your lived experience could be really different. Um, you know, I, I spent three years deep in the heart of researching what is actually faith. Um, you know, I, I claim that faith is uh, in, in my research, you know, it's really our innate desire and purpose to understand who we are and what we're made, made to contribute in the world. And for some folks, religion ties into some folks believe in more like spirituality and connection. But it all goes back to this idea of like, what are your lived experiences and how do you make meaning of them? And so I think going back to this idea of differences and division, I think we oftentimes forget that your lived experience is your your lived experience. Um, and it doesn't have to be the same as mine. We don't need to kind of take into consideration um, and, and worry about who's right and who's wrong because it's your lived experience. Um, and, and there's something to that. And I think if we're not willing to kind of sit there and listen and put ourselves in the shoes of others and, and understand or seek out understanding, then we're going to keep, you know, making this division wider and wider and wider as we go. And, um, you know, I, I think as a society at some point in time, we need to remember the like humanity and, and the dignity of all people and, and, you know, that I may not know you and your whole story, but, you know, I, I can still connect with you on a different level and I, and I can still be present and with you in that moment. This is a, an incredibly relevant conversation because it seems like the perfect antidote to the problems that we experience on social media, right? When you're talking yes. about you guys had a little bit of a gap, everybody pulls out their phones and starts going into the space of being alone together, aka everybody's on their device, although we're in an environment with other people where we could easily start conversations. I think that there's a there's an undertone and a current, if you will, of when we're on these social platforms, we have so much reinforcement that comes from the likes, the shares, the engagement, right? And the likes, shares, and engagement of specific behavior often reinforces the fact that we feel like we need to do those things in order to get the acknowledgement on those platforms, which in itself reinforces us being like someone else. But like you're talking about the lived experience that people have makes them unique and that is often the thing that stands out against a, a sea of copy and paste personalities. And it's just really scary to me to think about how the, the macro behavior of people continues to be more and more alike when we need people to be more and more different. And that difference is where the beauty of your individual experience in life comes out. Yeah, I, I mean, there's research out there that shows that we saw a significant uh, decline in mental health with young people beginning in 2014, which just happens to be the first time where smartphones, the iPhone, became more popular than flip phones. Um, and it's because folks oftentimes forget that people post what they want you to see on social media. That's not the whole essence of their being, right? And, and so you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily sitting there posting, you know, when I'm making breakfast at first thing in the morning, right? I mean, some people do, but, you know, you're not posting every moment of your life. In fact, oftentimes people only are posting the 
good moments. Um, and, and then it makes this culture and this thought that, you know, it's not okay to have moments of low. It's not uh, okay to have periods where you feel anxious. Just because you're anxious does not mean you have anxiety, right? Just because you're uncomfortable in a situation doesn't mean that it's not okay. But when we're only sharing what we want folks to see, and then that's becoming normalized and you're seeing, you know, all these people are traveling and all these people are, are you know, doing these great and wonderful things and everything is awesome. Um, I think of the Lego movie, right? Everything's awesome. And you're not actually seeing the journey, right? And the journey is the core of that story um, of who we are and what those lived experiences are. And, and I think we have to create space where we remind ourselves and remind each other um, that there's more to what life is on social media. But yeah, it's interesting that research actually goes back to when uh, smartphones we took a uh, uh, a hit and went higher um, than, you know, our flip phones back in the day or your little sidekicks or whatever they were. Um, and it's tied back to the fact that we are constantly connected and looking on, on social media and we're not seeing the whole story. We're just seeing a snapshot of what's going on in somebody else's life. We live in a society that we're just playing keeping up with the Joneses and social media is another way in which we're doing it. And the difference is, is, you know, me personally, I'm not gonna make any assumptions about your age. I was born in 1990. So like I went through school in a community where the only sense of comparison that I had was to the kids and people in my community. What happened when social media and everything dropped is we instantly became, I'm going to say maybe around 2012, 2013, when the algorithm started to change, 14 is like what you said, we became a global society. We started seeing people who had businesses in Europe and everybody living in Dubai and people going on jet setting trips to Asia and all this different type of stuff. And so naturally... Our brains can't handle that sense of global community. We're like, I want to say that the number, if you look into the study, says that like human connectivity and relationships start to diminish on a group that's bigger than 150. But if you think about how many followers and things you have on social media, right, those numbers are much larger than that. And so it's really interesting. I know that I, I looked at a study at one time and it was in 2012, 9% of girls had major depressive episodes. In 2023, 31% of girls had major depressive episodes. The correlation directly ties to social media and how integrated it's been into our lives. So very scary. Yeah. It, you know, I was talking earlier this semester in class, like one of the things that we've seen higher education navigate over the last 20 years is a rising mental health crisis, right? Um, and some folks will come back and they'll challenge it and say that, well, we talk about mental health more. And so we're just seeing it more because folks are talking about mental health more. Um, but there is exactly like you said, more and more uh, major mental health issues that are coming to fruition um, over the years. That, and the statistics are staggering when you look across higher education institutions folks that need greater numbers of services. Um, you know, we're also seeing institutions needing to provide 24-7 services. Um, so I love that, you know, not only do we have a standard um, counseling center and student health center on our campus, but we also provide 24-7, 365 telehealth services for both mental health and medical for students, because we know that it's going to be 2 a.m. in the middle of the night when a student, you know, has a, a period of stress, right? Because um, they're up studying or, or something happens, right? Um, but that goes back to this trend that we've seen over the last 20 years of more and more mental health concerns coming forward. And, and higher education institutions are, are not unique. We need to be equipped to navigate those. Um, but we also want to make sure that we help students develop strategies long after they graduate, right? Because it's great that we have all these services now, right? But what happens the second you cross that stage? What's the support that's going to be in place? And so we need to start developing more protective strategies around mental health. And some of it's having some real intentional conversations about social media and its use. No, I completely agree. I want to, I want to, I don't normally do this on the podcast, but I want to create like a free section here at the end. Sarah, <laughs> what should we be talking about that maybe we haven't talked about? I'm really interested in kind of like, what are some of the hot topic button burning items that are kind of on the front of your mind these days, especially with your unique perspective and such an impactful organization? Now you're making me be like, ooh, let me pull out the PowerPoint <laughs> that I had a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> After I just said, let's not be like the person that has the PowerPoint. Um, I, I mean, if we're looking ahead in higher education, right, um, if we're looking in just our world, um, I, I think you, you were just talking about, you know, looking at this diversity and not being fully equipped um, to navigate that. So I, I think for me, um, we use a language, right, in, in Catholic higher education, the Catholic faith, talking about like the universal family, right? Right. 
Um, and so I think we need to be willing to enter into those spaces because we do have this beautiful ability now to engage with folks across the world at any given moment in time. Um, but I think we need to also be willing and, and able to um, acknowledge those spaces and the different needs that folks bring into them. Um, and, and again, like we were talking about before, creating those lived experiences. So that's something that's on the you know top of my head. We definitely have mental health concerns that are coming in there. Um, the rising cost of higher education is in there. Um, I think we have some unique um, elements. If I was to go back in time, I love the fact that I um, did this beautiful dissertation. And I have a doctorate and talking about faith and higher education administration, all this great. Uh, but I think there's a need more and more for educators to have law backgrounds and legal backgrounds um, based upon some of the needs and the things that are happening um, in the sector. Um, I think just even as a society, we're a highly litigious society, especially in the United States. Um, and, and so, you know, we have folks that are coming through the field and more and more laws are coming into uh, the space, which are great. And they offer a lot of transparency, um, but you need to be able to read legal jargon um, and to be able to navigate those spaces a bit more. Um, and I think it changes the essence of what this position um, and what, you know, the work that I do was originally, right? Student Affairs was about, you know, supporting students and navigating and, and developing the whole person and looking at how do you develop faith and, you know, how do you identify uh, and develop your different identities? And and now we're sitting here, you know, did we post the, the Cleary compliance statistics in time for the federal government? And, you know, what's the difference between the 2020 and the 2024 uh, Title IX regulations that are coming out? You know, what is an injunction and, and what does that mean and where do we navigate it? And, you know, that just means it's a changing landscape and the nature of our field is different. So, I mean, I definitely th think there's some interestingness in that, that legal space. I also think we need to like get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? My work right now, I, I remember early in my career, my very first research project I did, I was still in uh, work on my master's in grad school. I was talking about the seven millennial mishaps. Since so we're talking about being born in 90, I'm a proud 80s baby, right? I'm gonna keep my side part and my skinny jeans as long as I can, right? But, you know, at that time I was looking at, you know, the tension between Gen X and boomers and millennials and, and that, and now we have, you know, Gen Z coming into the fruition. Well, guess what? Gen Alpha is right behind it. And so if we get once we get comfortable working with Gen Z, we need to remember that there's another generation behind it. Um, and so, you know, we just need to keep on our toes and be, be comfortable being uncomfortable and being willing to learn and adapt in those spaces. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question and a free for all. And, and it's interesting. I did. A, I made a joke in class. I made a Letterman top 10 list of all the things that have changed in higher education over the last 20 years. And then I realized that um, Letterman wasn't on the air for most of the people in the class. Oh um, my gosh. <laughs> uh, there was like two, two folks that uh, knew the reference and I was like, OK, all right, here we go. Uh, right. <laughs> So generational references, like I probably need to stop referencing uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off uh, whenever I'm like Bueller and people are like, I, I don't get it. Uh, Where is this right? Bueller kid at? Who are right? you? <laughs> like, He's talking about like, you. The last name? Or what are we looking for? Um, yeah, so it's interesting. You know, we, we need to look ahead and we need to look. Uh, behind one of the things that came up, I was uh, talking yesterday about um, assessment in student affairs. And this goes back to this idea you, you started at the top talking about return on investment. Right. And so it was really interesting to me looking at like, how did assessment kind of get lumped in to student affairs? And as I was looking at this journey over the period of time from the 1930s, where, you know, we saw this first call for like, hey, we need to like ensure that what we're telling people we're doing, we're actually doing. So an assessment is important to, you know, now we're seeing a lot of co-curricular language, looking at how we're measuring learning and, and whatnot, even curriculums within student affairs. Um, there's a whole institute for the curricular approach that looks at exactly that, you know, what are curriculums outside of the classroom setting in higher education. Uh, but the interesting part about it is over this period of time, since the 1930s to now, so almost a hundred years, uh, we've had like three or four cycles where we went back to be like, the purpose of higher education is critical thinking. And then it's, no, we have to, and most of the time it comes from the government being like, no, we have to actually uh, demonstrate the return on investment 
are you actually doing what you're saying? You know, there's periods of times that when we saw the increase of grants coming in, uh, federal grants, I think it was in the you know 1970s, we really saw an increase with it. Um, and so, right, you have to demonstrate with a grant, you know, the money that I'm getting, in, in this case from the federal government, this is what I'm actually doing, right? The goal is being matched. Uh, but we're in that same world right now where folks are saying, what's the return on an investment? And so at some point in time, we have to realize that history does repeat itself. Um, and so as much as I joke that pop culture references may not hit the same way that it once did, the fact of the matter is we have this beautiful history behind us. Um, and so the challenge that we're coming up right now in this change in enrollment and, and the decline it existed in the 19, you know, coming out of Vietnam, right? We saw we saw it coming out of World War II. This is not the first time that we've seen a decline in it. And so this is a great moment to kind of look back and see what we've learned um, over the last period of time. Take our, you know, Letterman top 10 list and, and kind of go down that road. But also look ahead about, you know, what did we learn during that period of time and how can we adapt and pivot uh, and utilize that to grow and be more innovative in the future? Well, I know with leaders like you leading the way, we are going to have those different perspectives, you know, but it's very important to kind of emphasize. I'm going to double click on that. History does repeat itself and it's so human to not look backwards and to only look forwards. And I think some of the great examples that we've seen in the past are just repeating themselves now. So, you know, Sarah, the last thing that we do here on the podcast as we put the plane down, right, to land it is we have a question that came from our previous guest. The previous guest wants to know, Sarah. What is the number one book that you enjoyed as a child and find yourself coming back to as an adult? Ooh, good questions. I am an avid reader. Um, probably read like 2,000 pages in the last week in a, in a book series, um, right? So I'm trying to think if there was a book that I went back to, I, I mean, I joked about my Harry Potter reference. I will say that that is a story that I've come back to a couple times, but now it's fun to come back to it with my child um, and watch her go through it and like read it and pick up on different things that I never saw the first time around. Um, but I think actually um, if I was to look back at some of the books um, that I read early on, I have this distinct uh, memory in a high school English class um, reading uh, Hamlet, actually. And at the time, I, I'm a city school kid, right? Um, and so I props to innovative teachers. Um, and getting us through Hamlet, we were told that at the end of it, we could watch an episode of The Simpsons that talked about Hamlet. So that was like the motivation uh, to get through reading this Shakespearean play and, and and looking through it. And I think there's so many interesting dynamics of conflict that come up in that story um, and, you know, how folks end up discussing it, um, you know, different nuances with it. And then the poetry that comes within the writing um, that while I, I have went through and read Hamlet probably once or twice since then. Um, I would say that, that story actually has been thread and shows up a lot in contemporary literature. Um, and so going back to this theme that we have going that like history repeats itself, um, you know, Hamlet is a great example of, of a story that keeps getting retold over and over again with just a little bit of a different spin along the way. Uh, but it's something that stands out to me. And then for fun, I think, you know, that ability to fantasize and get lost. I guess technically Harry Potter is education, right? He to go to Hogwarts. So maybe that sticks with me long, long after. So uh, that's a great question. Wow. I was like, I'm trying to think of like books that I've read multiple times and what came from it. I was like, oh, okay. Very interesting. Um, well, that's an amazing answer, Sarah. You know, well, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being the definition of heart and hustle. You know, you give me so much confidence in a space that's gotten a lot of flack, higher education over the last years, right? I'm glad to see that we have a new generation of leaders who are thinking about the important topics and pouring into the next generation of great leaders who are going to impact our communities as well. So Sarah Williamson, thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it.